What a joy and an honor it is for me to be able to share with you today a story of God's kindness and love and amazing grace in my life. It's a great privilege to speak during this homecoming week here at my alma mater. Cedarville University has played such a fundamental and transformational role in my life from the time I first arrived here in September 1992 as a freshman until now. I am forever grateful to my professors here who challenged me to consider what it means to live as a Christian professional in the field of engineering and who taught me what it means to live a godly life in this present age. And I'm thankful for that and I hope you're thankful for the opportunity that you have to study here at Cedarville because so many would probably love to be here, but you have been given this God-given opportunity. Take advantage of it. Thankful, as Dr. White has already mentioned, that my family has joined me today. You'll see my, my kids and my wife, they're all wearing our running gear, or as I like to call it, our battle gear uh, this morning. So we're wearing that to stick with the theme and I'm thankful for my mom and dad, as has been mentioned, they drove down from Michigan. Also good friends from Marysville, Ohio, drove to see me this morning. I'm thankful for you guys too and for my father-in-law as well. So these are just some of my cheerleaders. I, got, I have been blessed with many people who have supported me through some tough times. And I'm thankful for all. I have two goals this morning. First, I want to share with you some important life lessons that God has been teaching me since I graduated from Cedarville. Several of the most important lessons that I have learned have been the result of difficult trials that I have had to walk through. And I have had to see God's severe mercy in my life. God has also seen fit to use the unlikely, and you'll find out why, the unlikely intersection of life and running to teach me about endurance and overcoming. The second thing I want to accomplish this morning is that I want to challenge you briefly from the word of God to run the race of the Christian life with enthusiasm and confidence because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for you. So first, the story. I could tell you a lot about growing up in rural southwest Michigan and about the benefit of being part of a family where Christ was exalted, I'm thankful for that. I could tell you about how God in his mercy and grace saved me at a tender young age as I heard God's word taught week in, week out. If I had the time, I could tell you about my lifelong love of science and mathematics. I could tell you how I came to Cedarville College as an electrical engineering student in the fall of 1992 when the program was only three years old and the ENS building was just opening. So many good friends, so many godly professors who challenged and inspired me, so many amazing experiences living with the guys in Brock Hall, First Floor West. Little did I know when I showed up on campus that 26 years later, I would still be here teaching engineering, the discipline that I grew to love. What I will say is that God puts us exactly where he wants us to be, and he leads us in the path he wants us to trod, and God wanted me at Cedarville College. In 1994, while I was a student here, I began attending a church in Beaver Creek, Community Baptist Church, and that's now Grace Covenant Church. Little did I know at that time that 24 years later, I would still be at the same church. Little did I know that God would use the people in that congregation to encourage me and in such amazing ways. And, but here's the most important part. Little did I know that in 1999, God would bring a young, beautiful Cedarville student through the door of my, Sunday, my adult Sunday school class, and that lady would become my wife. And the mother of my four boys, which I call my small army, which are future Cedarville Yellow Jackets of the classes of roughly 2029, 20, 2031, 20, 2034, 20, and 2040. <laughs> I hope I'm still alive in 2040. 
We were married in 2002. You just never know. You never know what God will do, do you? Now, here's something that you need to understand, Kelly, because it's an important part of my story. Kelly is a serious distance runner. In 2002, when we got married, I didn't understand what that meant. I would ask her, Kelly, how far are you going to run today? She'll laugh at me when I say this. I would, in, I would innocently ask that question and she would say, oh, an easy 15 miles. I would, I never understood that. I understand a little better now. As a Cedarville Yellow Jacket, she ran both cross country and track and she excelled in those. She was an NAIA All-American in the marathon and both of us are deeply grateful. You see Coach King up there. We're grateful for the influence of her coaches on her and I'm thankful for their indirect influence on me through, through what she was doing. By the time we were married, Kelly had run the Boston Marathon twice. Now, being a somewhat competitive person, and as a good husband, first few years of marriage, trying to understand my wife better, I set out to start running. If she could run, so could I. But there was this one significant obstacle, and that is that I have a serious foot problem from birth. I have a moderately severe, here's the medical term for it, bilateral cavovarus foot, which is characterized by an extremely high arch, plantar flexion of the first ray, and hind foot varus. All that means, and all you need to know about that is that it makes it hard to walk and run and compete athletically. And as I've gotten older, it has given me more pain and ankle instability and balance problems and things like that. But this defect, this deformity, has been an occasion to learn many life lessons. And the first one is this. There's an x-ray of not my foot, but one like my foot. Here's the lesson. Learn to recognize your infirmities as God's special gifts. God made you just the way you are for a reason. Blemishes and all, deformities and all. In my thinking, there are really two ways that you can choose to respond to how God made you. Some of us look at ourselves and think, why did God make me like this? Why do I have this, this defect? Where did this disease come from? And why do I have to put up with it? Why do I have this thorn in the flesh? On the other hand, maybe we ought to say, thank you, God, for how you made me. It's not easy to do, is it? Thank you for giving me this special impediment so that I might remember that my strength is to come from you and that I shouldn't try to rely on myself. Thank you for the opportunity to learn to be humble. Thank you for this opportunity to make much of Jesus through my weakness. And then we ought to remind ourselves of God, that God's grace is sufficient for us as believers for his power is made perfect in weakness. I had to learn this lesson. It doesn't come naturally. But there's a follow-on lesson. Purpose within your heart that by God's grace you will overcome in spite of your weaknesses. Many people allow themselves to be defined by their problems, their health, their family situation, their financial situation. Some of them despair, some of them lose heart. They become despondent and they become paralyzed by fear and I, I can understand that, I can relate to that. But we as Christians have reason to be confident, especially when we look at our maladies the things that ail us, the things that afflict us, whether they be physical or spiritual. Why? Because we know that it is in our weakness that Christ will show his power. After a discussion of his thorn in the flesh, the apostle Paul says confidently, I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And then he goes on to say confidently, when I am weak, then I am strong. Does this mean that all will somehow magically be well if I am in Christ? I don't think that's what it means at all. 
Does it mean that I can count on God's power to be at work through me as I press forward with my weakness? Absolutely. So the story continues. In 2004, I enthusiastically and naively, I might add, signed up for my first marathon to be held at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The farthest I had run up to this time when I made this decision was seven or eight miles, I think. And sadly, I didn't train or do much that would have helped my experience to go better. Nor did I anticipate the toll that such a distance, 26.2 miles, would take on me because of my foot deformity. I thought, if I can't run that far, at least I can walk that far. Well, maybe, maybe not. My body was just not ready for that experience. And I had problems. At mile 14, I experienced a cramp that was very, very painful. A result of my uneven gait. Only, only 12.2 miles to go. Somehow, not sure how, except for God's help, and just perseverance, I determined to keep moving forward, to keep putting one foot in front of the other. By mile 25, I could hardly walk. They say that walking backwards helps. I tried that, and it didn't help. (laughs) Just when I thought I couldn't go any farther, God provided an army nurse, and you can see him there in the picture, who was walking the race, and he came up behind me and noticed my distress, and offered to allow me to put my arm around his shoulder so that I could, on every step, keep the weight completely off my right leg. We finished the last 1.2 miles together. I still feel that old injury from time to time and remember that man who was a faithful wingman there at the end of the race. But I learned an important lesson, and it's this. To accomplish anything significant is going to require hard work, and a significant investment of blood, sweat, and tears. There is no such thing as an easy victory. It is true in marathoning. It is true in the Christian life. I had to decide whether to forget marathoning or whether I wanted to do better at this point. I decided that I needed to try again. I began training more. I began running more. My feet were an ever-present reminder of my weakness, but they were also an ever-present reminder that God loved me. I started using a marathon training program. It was an 18-week program that I could do throughout the heat of summer. On at least two occasions in August, when it was super hot and super humid, I remember getting up around 4 o'clock in the morning to try to get in 20 miles, mostly before the sun came up running from my house in Beaver Creek to Xenia and back. All of this effort paid off and I saw my times improve. I completed eight more full U.S. Air Force marathons. In 2012, I completed my last full marathon and had the unexpected joy of completing the last few miles with my colleague, Dr. Scott Dixon. Two are better than one, and two in pain can encourage one another (laughs) to keep moving, and that's exactly what we did, crossing the finish line in just under six hours. It was a blessing, and I'm thankful for that last marathon that I did. All of those steps, however, were taking an unseen toll on on my feet. In 2013, I noticed a strange bump appearing on the lateral side of my right foot, and I ignored it. There is an x-ray coming up if you're, it's not too, it's not too bad, but there's a screw in the x-ray if you want to close your eyes, but most of you probably be okay. I needed a screw. I broke my foot and had to have a screw put in. I needed surgery. Needless to say, no marathon this year. And here's the lesson. Here's the lesson. You and I are going to face huge disappointments in life. After that surgery, things were never the same with my right foot. It was weakened in some ways. In 2014, 
I signed up again for the U.S. Air Force Marathon. When race day came in September, it didn't take long during that race to realize that something wasn't going well. My foot and my ankle were misbehaving. Part of the issue with my foot is that the ankle just wants to twist in, and mine just was twisting and twisting during that race, and it got worse and worse the farther I went. I eventually resorted to walking on the edge of the road so that I could use the lip of the edge of the road to support my foot, in spite of wearing an ankle brace. At mile 22, a course marshal said to me that I needed to come off the course. And they took me to a medical tent, and put ice on my foot and ankle, and as I laid there, I kept insisting to the doctor that if he would just allow me to go, I could make it to the finish line. And he finally relented and let me go. I made it one more mile and I sat right down on the pavement and told the two police officers who happened to be standing there that I couldn't go any farther. And they came and they took me to the finish line. And it's hard to realize when you see that finish line that you're not gonna cross it that day. It's hard to realize that 23.5 miles is not enough and there would be no finisher's medal. So you're gonna face disappointments. We're all gonna face dis disappointments and adversity. How are we going to handle those adversities? We can either be crushed by them or we can learn to see them as God's special providences for our good and for his glory. We need to learn to see, as John Newton once penned, that behind a frowning providence, there shines a smiling face. God wants us to be holy, and he often uses hardships and disappointments to do his sanctifying work. But for me, there was more sanctifying work, more refining yet to do. It was 2014, and my most difficult trial health-wise was still to come. During the summer of 2015, I was uncertain whether I was going to be able to run any more marathons. I did some training, but things didn't go well. I just fell out of shape. I knew that with my foot injury, I had lost some level of fitness, so I attributed it to that, but something wasn't right. On October 19th, 2015, I woke up to my alarm to get ready to come here to Cedarville to work and I didn't feel well at all. My heart was beating hard, and I had an, there was an odd rhythm to it. I got up and went into the bathroom to get a drink of water and began to have cold sweats. I was frightened. I came back and sat down on the bed, and I woke up Kelly, and I said, honey, I think you should call 911 because something is wrong with my heart. And there's nothing more frightening than not knowing what is going on inside one's own body. We talk as Christians about trusting God. In those moments, I wondered what he was doing and I struggled to trust. The Beaver Creek Fire Department arrived at my house within about three minutes with an ambulance and a fire engine. They got me into the ambulance to evaluate what was going on. They hooked me up to an EKG to look at the electrical activity of my heart, and they ran a strip of that. Run another one, said the man who was in charge. They ran another one. And then he said, we need to go very urgently. I heard the driver tell the dispatcher over the radio, Beaver Creek Medic 63 en route to Miami Valley Hospital with one ER. I had listened to the scanner enough to know that ER meant we were going to be going with lights and sirens. Apparently, I was in danger. They started an IV. They gave me baby aspirin to chew. They gave me a pill to put under my tongue. By now, I knew what that was. That was nitroglycerin. I was having a heart attack of a very serious variety, I might add. For those of you medical types, my EKG showed an elevated... ST segment indicating a potentially deadly problem, and I was 42 years old. Why, God? I didn't know what to make of what was happening to me. I knew that God hadn't abandoned me, but in that moment, I kind of wondered where he was and what he was up to. 
So we sped down US 35. I could see out the back window. The cars were parting to make way for us. Many things were going through my mind in, the, in those moments. Would I make it to the hospital in time? Would I see my wife and kids again? Would my heart just stop beating right there in the ambulance? I realized in that moment that I might soon enter into the very presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thought I'd better start singing, and I did, out loud, in the back of the ambulance. And I don't know how, um, I don't know who chose the music this morning, but the song, first song that we sang was the song that I began to sing. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O my soul, worship his holy name. If I was going to see Jesus in those moments, I purposed to enter his presence singing his praises. But God was not ready to call me home yet. I'm thankful for that. When we arrived at the hospital, I was quickly wheeled into the heart catheterization lab where there were about 10 people waiting to see me. They were well choreographed and each person had a job. They prepared me for surgery just in case. The long and short of it is that they knew from my EK, I'm sorry, um, imaging soon revealed that I had 100% blockage of my lateral anterior descending coronary artery, otherwise affectionately known as the Widowmaker. <sighs> Dr. Wensky placed two medicated stents into the artery going up through my right leg and into my heart. You cannot believe the relief I felt when that artery was opened back up and I did feel it. I felt the difference and I'm thankful for how that felt. I was in the hospital for two nights in the cardiac ICU before I could go home for a long physical and emotional recovery. But I now understood better than ever before the lesson that was up there, lesson five, that life is a vapor and we are not guaranteed tomorrow. None of us are. None of us are guaranteed the rest of this day. No one could tell me why I had a heart attack at age 42. I didn't have any of the risk factors. I'm not a smoker. I wasn't overweight. I exercise regularly. I didn't even have high cholesterol. But it matters not. What I needed to know and what I needed to do was to come to terms with the fact that God had lessons to teach me and work he wanted to do and still wants to do. I am still grappling with what those lessons are three years later. He wanted to teach me greater faith and trust in him, greater dependence upon his sustaining grace. C.S. Lewis in his The Problem of Pain writes that God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. A heart attack was God's megaphone to rouse this young man. It is to our detriment if we fail to hear what God has to say to us in our times of suffering. Life after a heart attack proved difficult and I had much to learn about what it meant to live with heart disease. My diet was restricted and I lost 35 pounds in about four months. I went through 12 weeks of cardiac rehab where I did monitored exercise. Perhaps the hardest thing I faced in the months following my heart episode was the kind of, a kind of emotional struggle. At cardiac rehab, they told me that a heart attack survivors face something similar to PTSD. And I struggled with the thought that at any moment, I might experience another cardiac event. I battled the fear. I struggled with sleep. There were many long nights and I made several trips back to the ER with random scary sensations in my chest. By the way, this is, I wanted to show you this guy. This is Jeremy. Jeremy was one of the firefighters that saved my life on that October morning three years ago. I ran into him later and we got this picture together with my kids. Thankful for him for how God used him in my, in my life. 
But you can see there the lesson that I needed to learn and I'm still learning and I want you to learn as well. And that is that God wants us to trust him completely. God wants us to cling to him as if our life depended on it because it does. It was a comfort to know that God holds me in the palm of his hand. It was a comfort for me to know that while I may not know what is going on inside my body that God does, and not a hair can fall from my head without his knowledge. In those days, I stumbled upon the words of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, where he says, our belief in God's wisdom supposes and necessitates that he has a settled purpose and plan in the work of salvation. He goes on to say, in every bone, joint, muscle, sinew, gland, and blood vessel, you mark the presence of God working everything according to his design in infinite wisdom. God is working his design in every blood vessel. Comforting words. I can trust, and I'm learning to trust in God's providence, and you ought to trust him too. As Dr. White has often reminded us, God is faithful and you can trust him completely. I'm thankful to report that my heart, attack, my heart suffered no significant damage during that heart attack. This was a huge blessing. As the days went on, I knew I needed to be active again. At first, activity seemed scary and dangerous for me. But the doctors told me that activity was exactly what I needed. But what was hard was getting out on my own again, to exercise alone. But with time, I knew I had to start running again, and I did run short at first and then longer. By the beginning of 2016, I knew I needed to try to run an event in the U.S. Air Force Marathon, and so I signed up for the 10K, 6.2 miles, and I can tell you that by God's grace, I finished that race in September of 2016, less than a year after my heart attack. And the lesson is, trust in Jesus and get back in the race. We ought not allow ourselves as Christians to wallow in our adversity. It's easy to do, we ought not do it. If we truly trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we must as he gives us strength, get back up and keep on moving, building and working for him. By God's grace, I want to be an encouragement for people to do just that. So that's my story, and I just briefly want to point out something from Scripture to you from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, where Paul encourages Timothy by telling of his own life, and he says, I have fought the good fight, I wish I had more time to talk to you this morning about fighting the good fight. But he also says, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I want to talk to you real quickly about finishing the race. The Christian life, the Christian life is a race. And then we are called as Christians to persevere in it. You must seek to run to win. If you're a Christian here this morning, then you're in the race. Are you running? In the many marathons that I've run, I've noticed a couple things. They're long. They seem to never end. They're grueling. There's pain involved. There's exhaustion involved. They require endurance. Another thing I've learned is that if you don't finish the race, you don't complete, you don't get the, the prize, you don't get the medal. And so it is with the Christian life. This is no 100 meter dash to which God has called us, but rather it is a distance event that will require every ounce of strength that you can muster. Like the hardships faced by the soldier, the distance runner must be prepared to face the course in front of him or her, the heat, the thirst, and the pavement. But how can we run? I don't know if I have the strength. What I, when I face life's trials, I have wondered if I could persevere. Some of you are here and you're struggling to persevere. 
You don't know how you can keep on running the race of the Christian life. Perhaps you want to sit right down on the pavement and quit. I've been there, both on a real marathon course and in life. The fact of the matter is, is that you and you in and of yourself have no strength, no ability to finish the race. I brought this sign this morning. I can quickly show this to you. This is an actual course marker from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base that used to hang out there on one of the loneliest parts of the course. And it's mile marker 17, 9.2 miles to go. My experience was, is it's at this point right here that serious fatigue starts to set in. This is where the doubts begin. What am I doing here? Why did I sign up for this race? I want to quit. My heart attack was a mile 17 moment in my Christian life. Some of you are at mile 17 right now, today. You want to just throw in the towel on the Christian life because you don't think you can go any farther. But herein lies the hope. And I'm gonna finish with this. Your legs will fail you. Your stamina will give out. But there is one, our champion, who has gone on before us and has finished the race. He has already crossed the finish line. And when we look unto him, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He waits for us at the end of our race. Oh, to hear him say, oh, to hear him say at the end of our race, well done, good and faithful servant. So here's my challenge to you as we end. Let's push through the tape to gain the prize. Go past mile marker 17, go for 18, go for 19, keep going. Keep running by faith. Keep casting off every weight and the sin which clings so tightly and run with patience the race that God has marked off for you. Let's pray. Our Father, we are thankful that you've given us a race to run. I pray that you would help all of us to run it well for you to win the prize. Help us, O oh God, to, um, by your strength, overcome the sin that is in front of us, the obstacles that face us, and the hardships that are ahead. Thank you that we can know that you are with us as we run the race to gain the prize. Please be with these students. I pray that you bless the rest of their day. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.